Good morning, church. <laughs> Welcome to Easter Sunday. Uh, happy Easter to each and every one of you here in the sanctuary and those of you joining us at home uh, online. Happy Easter. Uh, my name is Amy Haynes, and I am the pastoral care minister at St. David's United. I will be presiding over the service today, and I am so grateful to be here with you all. Um, before I even begin and jump into this uh, worship that I hope will be nourishing and soul-filling for us all, I just want to uh, first remind folks about these flowers that you see up front. Um, for those of you that have purchased flowers in memory of someone or in honor of someone, they will be available to pick up after today's service and after the vote which follows today's service. So uh, please know that you can come and get your flowers at that time. As I just said, there is a vote after today's service um, to formalize our partnership, our relationship uh, with Northminster United. So please stay, and those of you online, please stay so that we can make that official. Uh, we do need to do that. Um, I think that's it, but one more thing. Uh, Holy Week has been rich for me, and I hope rich for you, um, but none of it was po would be possible uh, without some committees and some people, and I want to thank them now. Um, I want to thank Darlene, uh, the lead of our... I don't even see her. Um, she's probably working, I'm telling you. She's probably doing something right now that uh, needs doing. Um, so I want to thank her so much for her work with the worship committee. I want to thank... <laughs> there she is. Uh, I want to thank Cheryl, who heads up our Sacred Service Committee. Uh, they have both done so much and informed me, a new minister, of so many of the traditions that you have here that I wanted to stay true to. So without them, I wouldn't have known. Thank you. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Ruth, who also was a great help to me during this Holy Week uh, with all of her work and moving things, and uh, she was lifting and doing all kinds of stuff. So thank you, Ruth. Um, and then again, um, none of these worship services come together without the, the collaboration uh, that uh, Brent, our music director, and I do together. So thank you, Brent, for being such a treasure. Thank you. And uh, just a treasure to work with, and so, um, Amazing, I think, what we have done together over this time, not only Holy Week, but all of this time of working together. I'm really grateful. And to our amazing choirs in all their iterations, thank you so, so much. Um, I recently found out that you're not supposed to become a minister and then change everything and throw new music at people and, you know, do your own thing. Um, I didn't know that, so... <laughs> so yeah, so I did do that, and, and you guys just handled it so beautifully. Thank you for singing all of that new music and making it sound like you'd been singing it forever. I appreciate that. Um, so that all of that being said, again, I wish you a happy Easter. Thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us online. I want to um, invite Ruth, my intrepid candle lighter, to come forward. Um, Today is a special day. It's the first day after this long Holy Week that we light the new fire, that we light the new candle um, for Christ and for, for Easter. So I say to you all, this is the dawn of a new creation, and please come and be inspired by the new fire. Christ is risen. Thank you. And we also want to begin our worship in a good way by acknowledging the land. This land where the Bow River meets the Elbow River has been stewarded since time immemorial by the indigenous peoples of this region. Today, we gather in the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, including the Siksika, the Pekani, and the Kainai Nations, the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw and Wesley Nations, and the Tsutina Nation. I want to say that Southern Alberta is also the home of Métis 
uh, the Métis people of Alberta in Region 3, and that we commit ourselves uh, to be in right relationship with the land, with all of creation, and with all peoples who make this place home. This is a deep work of reconciliation, and it requires our empathy, our humility, and our repentance. May it be so. We also light today our affirming candle, proudly saying that we do affirm all people in this congregation. And so we pray, God of infinite manifestations, free us from the shame that confines, judgment that destroys, bring healing to the wounds of being told that we are too big, too much, too feminine, or too butch, too young, or too old, or too queer. Ground us in the truth that sets us free, that we are all the work of a divine hand, and that the holy lives resurrected in our flesh. Wherever we struggle to believe, meet us there, and move our bodies with joy and purpose. So I ask you now to speak aloud our call to worship with me today. Christ has risen. God is alive. Hope is alive. Love is alive. I want to bless this dear one over here. Bless you. Joy is alive. We are alive. We are alive. <laughs> All right. The church is transformed and alive. Amen. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, you show us the meaning of hope that after tragedy, after death, there is more meaning to be lived. There is more beauty to witness, more intimacy to experience, more relationships to delight in, more liberation to embody. Embolden us to be a people who practice this hope. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able and join in singing our first hymn this morning from Voices United 409, Morning Has Broken. I also say, if it is in your heart to do so, you can come forward during the singing and place your flower in the cross.
Join me now in saying our prayer of confession. Loving God, we confess that at times we do not share in the joy of resurrection, but are caught in the worries of the world. We confess that we do not always live in the spirit of new life, but remain discontent, grumbling, and anxious. Forgive us for not sharing in the good news. Forgive us when we find it more comfortable to worry and complain than to risk the joy and encouragement of new life in Christ. Call us back to your ways, O God, to seek hope and reconciliation, restoration and peace. In the name of the risen Christ, we pray. Amen. Christ is risen. The stone is rolled away. The tomb is found empty. Mary calls out, I have seen the Lord. We have seen Christ too. In every helping hand, in every heartfelt gift, in every choice made to restore life, to resist evil, and to seek justice in this world. We are called to give this new life a life of forgiveness and reconciliation. You are forgiven. I am forgiven. Let us accept our forgiveness and know that God loves us and desires great joy for our lives. Walk forward in your journey of faith, in our shared journey of faith knowing that your siblings in Christ are always with you. Amen.
Our first reading this morning is from Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah promises a, a, a new land. He promises a, a new heaven, and he promises an environment in which, in which there is peace, uh, the likes of which have never been known uh, since the beginning of time. The glorious new creation is Isaiah 65, voices 17 to 25 in the New Revised Standard Version. For I am about to create new heaven and new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I'm about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it or the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days or an old person who does not live out a lifetime. For one who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth, and one who falls short of a hundred will be considered accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or but bear children for calamity, for they shall be offspring blessed by the Lord and descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer. Before they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together the lion shall eat straw like the ox, but the serpent, its food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Follow now with Psalm 118, Voices United, page 837. Let Israel now say, Let the house of Aaron say, Let those who fear God say, Open to me the gates of the temple, that I may enter and give thanks to God. I thank you for that you have answered me. You have become my salvation. This is God's doing, marvelous in our eyes. Save us, O oh God, we pray. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of God. God, our God, has given us light. You are my God, and I will thank you.
The third uh, scripture this morning is taken from the Acts of the Apostles, 10, verses 34 to 43 of the New International Version. Then Peter, beca Peter addresses at this time, by the way, uh, uh, makes an address in the house of Cornelius. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross. <laughs> But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, and everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And our fourth reading of scripture this morning comes from the Gospel according to John 20, verses 1 to 18 of the New Revised Standard Version the empty tomb. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to, Saint Pete, to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. And we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head, the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord. I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? 
Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned to him and said, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God <laughs> and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them, that he had said these things to her. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Let us pray. Search my heart and know me, God. Try me and see if there is any destructive way in me, any way that does not reflect your light. And when you find it, O oh God, I pray that you remove it and cast it into the sea of forgetfulness. Lead me in the way everlasting, for you, O oh God, are my rock and redeemer. May the words from my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Good morning, church. Christ is risen. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I want to start out by... Just posing the question, you know, what do we mean when we say this? When we say, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. I think what we might be saying as Christian people, as followers of Jesus, when we proclaim this truth of Easter, is perhaps that we are speaking to the kind of people that we want to be. So, one person says... Christ is risen, and I think what that means, the subtext is, I am someone who is trying to live presently, right now, but I'm holding the reality of the realm of the final things, and I'm doing so in the midst of an unfolding history. The other responds, he is risen indeed, and I think that means, me too, I'm with you. Let's take the crucified off the cross together because we acknowledge and we recognize that death has been defeated. Hallelujah. I think we're affirming to one another that we seek to live the kind of transformed lives that allow us to hold the paradox of death bringing forward new life. We affirm in these words, our desire and our aim to see the world as it can be, a new heaven, a new earth, the way it's promised to be. But we never look away from what is. And in doing so, we are moved in our spirits and in our lives to align with the crucified and to, with supreme tenderness, remove them from the cross and bear faithful witness to their living and their triumph over suffering and humiliation. So one of the last things I said in my reflection from yesterday, from Holy Saturday, was love sings the last note. And I believe this to be true. This is the truth of this universe. I, I really believe that with all my heart. Love sings the last note. And I don't imagine 
that we can ever be clever enough or good enough, wise enough, ambitious enough to do that on our own. But I do believe that by our own transformation from this gospel, from this good news spoken by women, <laughs> spoken by women first, by this good news gospel where Jesus vanquishes death, we are invited into singing love's chorus. And we do that by bearing witness to where we see resurrection and we enact resurrection in our own spaces. As it is said by our Jewish siblings in the Ethics of the Fathers, or the Pirkai Avot, it is not incumbent upon you to finish the task, but neither are you free to absolve yourself from it. God will never abandon us to the work of the world, but I think we are asked to engage with the hope and faithful understanding we have of what heaven might look like here on earth. In today's scripture, Jesus, who was love incarnate, love enfleshed, he was found there outside the tomb by Mary. And Mary, who had been weeping for the one she loved so deeply and had followed so devotedly, she mistook him, that holy one, for the gardener. And I find that funny, actually. <laughs> I've always been amused by that, that the Son of God could be overlooked as the help before being recognized. And there are, I think, layers of poignancy in that. When we think of those who are right now bent over in hot fields to the south of us, picking delightful fruits that we might place upon our Easter waffles and pancakes to follow service. Do we imagine that their sweat-soaked brown brows might require a second glance to see a glimpse of the risen Christ? How do the exploited ever get taken off the cross if we cannot see in them the image of our beloved Jesus? Jesus, as the gardener, does not let us forget that just a few days before his crucifixion, he said in John chapter 12, verse 24, unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And so there in the garden, back from the dead, Jesus is not only mistaken for, but actually is now the gardener the gardener of the resurrection, the nurturer of hope, tender shoots of hope. The seed of divinity and love's power sown, planted, and resurrected in the garden of the tomb. Our everlasting hope, mercy, mercy as the tender, the gardener of our spirits. Church, I'm sure that over the years you've heard many, many, in some cases many, <laughs> Easter reflections that proclaim hope. But I want you today to consider that hope is not a state of mind. Hope is not a flimsy thing. Hope is a do word. It requires that we do something that we step out on faith that God has defeated death, and that we are emboldened then with tenacity to do acts of moral courage during a time of deep uncertainty in the world, where our instinct might just be to retreat. Hope requires that we keep living, that we risk vulnerability, that we agitate to enact justice, even when it costs us, especially when it costs us. That is doing hope. Now, after these years, we are now going into our third year of pandemic, 
we have come to know a little something about faith that costs, faith that must endure despite challenge, despite pain, loneliness, and death. We have seen so much death. For many, the hope for this year was that we would not be facing a sixth wave of COVID and having to weigh the pros and cons of, do we come into the sanctuary today or do we stay home? Do we get to hug our friends and family or do we have to stay away? But we all find ourselves here in one way or another. And I trust that all of you have made the decision that best suits you and your health and your need to connect with others, to fight the death of loneliness. I want to say, though, that perhaps like the two Easter's past, some of us do still feel like Easter exiles. And there are those of us for whom this Easter celebration might feel dampened or muted because of the circumstances. Please remember, church, that we are not the first of our lineage. Our lineage is long. Our spiritual ancestors are many. Adam and Eve started this whole thing off, and uh, they got exiled too. So <laughs> our whole scripture just keeps telling us stories of spiritual ancestors who were exiled. It's part of the gig, I think. <laughs> but by saying that, I want to remind you that hope is a do word. So even in the midst of our exile, we do hope by continually, continuing to visualize and pray that we will be able to embrace freely again. That we will be able to worship without calculations of safety. That peace will reign all over the world. That a new heaven and a new earth will be made in the shape of the most merciful one, the gardener. So our hope is that the things of the past will be lifted from our psyche. We will not remember them, as the scripture tells us, that we will no longer have anxiety and pain, which are so real to us now. So we do hope by continuing to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. We become the seeds of resurrection this way. We reach out to our future progeny and the generations to come and say, we have not been excused from the task. We did our part. We enacted hope. And now you can too. And this is how we sing love's chorus. And so as we do hope, I wonder if we can simultaneously reflect upon and claim our identity as exiles. How would that change your faith? I want to quote the great Ellen Davis uh, on this question. And she wrote this long before coronavirus ever kept us out of church. But she pondered as well, what might it mean for us to claim our identity as exiles while striving, while striving for superficial forms of community will leave us lonely and undisciplined? a full recognition that we are in some way either aligned with or actually marginalized, alienated, or reeling from loss can propel us actually into the real community called church. Because church is not about us keeping it all together, being in our best clothes, never crying, Stiff upper lipping it. That's not church. Church is messy and real. Church, I hope that we have learned during this time that, that church is so much more, actually, than a place or a building. I see resurrection in children 
bouncing up and down, and it reminds me that my knees are asking for resurrection too. <laughs> They're doing the like, you know, Ukrainian uh, kicks and jumps and everything. Anyways, I digress. <laughs> um, but church is so much more than a building, and it's so much more than even children playing or elders sharing. It is us, that's what it is. And it's wonderful for us to be here in the sanctuary that means so much to you all. Yes, it is. Um, but there's more, right? I think it is us. We are the followers of this anointed gardener. We are seeking to become what Dr. King called the beloved community. A people who thirsts and hungers to enact the joy of resurrection amongst all peoples. Peoples who are locked into Holy Saturday. People who have never had the joy of Easter. Those, that is how we enact this resurrection. We let those people who have been bound to the suffering of the cross and all of the violence that it represents we take them down with care and we share in God's holiness so that we may recognize one another as gifts of grace. And we discover in the light of this grace that we have finally found our true home and that there are no bricks, no mortar necessary, just us. So let us be sustained by the God made known in less this life death and resurrection of Jesus. And let us believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the last word. We pray, Gardener Jesus, stay with us. We will try not to cling on to you, but we will walk confidently knowing that you are among us always. Make us holy through your unbound spirit. Make us your resurrected church. For we know that all things come to being through you. Life itself has come into being through you. And it is our life, the light of all people. This light shines radiantly for us this Easter day. Hallelujah. And we see it, we proclaim it, and we proclaim that it was not overcome by humiliation, nor by suffering, nor death, Love, church, love sings the final note forever. And may we join in its triumphant harmony. Hallelujah. Amen.
I hear you, kiddo. <laughs> Soon. Soon. <laughs> it's my favorite part of the service. This is when we get to pass the peace to one another, the peace we find in resurrection, the joy we feel on this day. As I've been saying the past couple of weeks, passing the peace is an ancient and transformative spiritual practice. It is more than just saying hi to your neighbor. This has survived millennia through plagues, through conflicts. Sharing the peace started out as a way for us as Christian people to be in community and to reconcile to one another before we made our offerings at the altar or before we took communion. And so I know that COVID has left some of us wary of contact and closeness, and that is okay. But know that you can offer the peace with a wave, a bow, elbow bump, or you can place your hands over your heart and offer the love of your heart to your neighbor. Uh, this is good too. You know, the old 60s, you guys were there, you know. <laughs> some of you were there. Um, <laughs> some of you were here in the 60s, never mind. That's great. Okay, um, so if you feel safe to do that, you can also do a consensual, that means with permission, hug or a handshake with your neighbor. But not everybody wants to do that, so make sure you ask first. Um, and so I say to you, with all that preamble, may the peace of Christ be with you always. Share that peace with your neighbor.
I feel like, I feel like I'm gonna cry. Okay. I know you love each other. I love you too. We still have church. <laughs> There's more to come. Much to this guy's disappointment over here, we have <laughs> church still. Okay. Oh, that was really beautiful. Uh, I feel emotional. Try to keep it together here for you. Although I just said in the sermon, you don't have to. So I guess I can cry and pray at the same time. Um, we come to the time in our service where we do our offerings. Now, of course, we do this differently during a time of COVID than we did before. So before we pray our prayer of dedication, I just ask you to bring to mind, I know so many of you give generously, uh, just bring your generous spirit to mind, um, hold that spirit of generosity in your heart, and we will pray this prayer over our gifts, which exists mostly in the ether with e-transfers and all that today, but we will pray this prayer. Generous and surprising God, when we thought that death had claimed your only son, you amazed us with the resurrection. Surprise us again with your ability to transform our humble offerings into gifts that will enliven resurrection in the world through our witness to your love. We lay our very lives at your feet, O Holy One, confident that you will use us to proclaim and embody the gospel. Amen. Let us pray for the community. I'll lead this prayer, but please feel free to hold those you love in your heart, and I will leave silence and space for your own prayers as well. Dear God, in the joy and hope of this Easter morning, we sing Alleluia with the fullness of hearts. Christ is risen. Love is stronger than death. Hallelujah. In the joy and hope of this Easter morning, amid our singing and shouting and mixing and mingling, we know that there are those who are bewildered and sad. And we pray for those who have no hope, those who suffer from depression, loneliness, and fear. We pray for those places and peoples in our world where death and domination rule, where imperial powers ignore the poor, where war never ends, where children are hungry, where parents grieve because they cannot provide, where children's voices have gone silent, where accidents happen and death abounds senselessly. We pray too for those held hostage by addiction and chronic illness that debilitates we pray for those in our community who have asked and requested for prayer. We pray for Mark and Diane and our St. David's community. We pray for Sandra. In the joy and the hope of this Easter morning, we realize the depth and the breadth of what it means to be your Easter people. For we are the ones who are called to go into the places in our lives and in the world to work for justice and life for all your creation. We are called to take those still crucified off the cross. It is up to us to bear witness to the promise of resurrection, to hold and comfort those in despair and to drive a stick into the spoke of injustice. We are called to believe for all who are in despair that love is stronger than death. In the joy and hope of this Easter morning, O oh God, we know that you know the prayers of our heart, the deepest ones that have not yet found words, that you draw near and hear those aches that are deeper than words in our silence.
In the joy and the hope of this Easter morning, O God, give us the courage to bear your living love in every corner of our lives so that your peaceable realm, a new heaven and a new earth, will be so here on earth as it is in heaven. In the name of the risen Christ, we pray. Hallelujah. Amen. And I believe we're going to sing the Lord's Prayer this morning. ask you to stand as you are able and we will sing our closing hymn for today we know that Christ is raised Stay standing if you are able to, and let us affirm our faith by saying together the new creed. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope in life, in death, and life beyond death. 
God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Surprise, we get to renew our baptism this morning, um, and I'm so excited about that. So I want to say to you, at various moments on the journey of our life in Christ, we have the opportunity to reaffirm and renew our faith proclaimed at our baptism. This Easter, we stand on the precipice pardon me, of a new chapter as our life as a church. We will require the nurture and guidance of the Holy One as we envision who we might become and how we might do hope in the world. Today we have affirmed our faith in God, we have spoken aloud our intent to seek justice and resist evil, we have made a commitment to follow in the way of Jesus, and we have participated by our gifts in the mission of the church. These are all part of a baptism service. And so I ask you now, the final thing, as a baptized and baptizing church, will you continue to support one another as we take a fresh step into a new chapter of our life with God. And if you agree, you can say, we will, God being our helper. We will, God being our helper. So I say to you all now, remember your baptism and be thankful. Hallelujah. <laughs> Cover your glasses. <laughs> Remember your baptism and be grateful. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to tell you all about this evergreen branch. I'm going to get you to in the choir. Don't you worry. We're all getting renewed today. Brent, I won't wreck your organ, but just a little sprinkle. <laughs> As I went to search for this blessed evergreen branch, remember your baptism and be grateful. Remember your baptism and be grateful. I met by the tree. I was in a prayerful state, as ministers are, when they're doing special things. And uh, I wanted to find just the right branch. Remember your baptism and be grateful. Hallelujah. Remember your baptism and be grateful. Um, and I came face to face under the tree with a bunny, maybe the Easter bunny, you guys. And that little guy or gal or non-binary uh, said to me in its silent way, remember your baptism and be grateful. That's the one. Get this one. And we stared eye to eye my beautiful brown eyes and its beautiful brown eyes and it felt meant to be so remember your baptism and be grateful and know that all of nature moves with us and blesses you on this day i i lied and said that was our final hymn we're going to sing again let's sing again <laughs>
out into the world hopeful for a new heaven and a new earth, dedicated to tenderly removing the crucified from their crosses, we are made tenacious and resurrected in our spirit, made new by our worship and our remembering of the power of the living water. We are ready to do hope. <laughs> So I say to you today, may the grace of God, deeper than our own imagination, the mercy of Christ, stronger than our need, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, whose gentle wind and fiery tongue inspires and guides, may they all draw near and sustain us today and all of our tomorrows. Amen. Amen. Good. This year I'm going to invite you to stand as able at your places and join the choir and orchestra in singing. Thank you. 